Thank you so much, Chairperson, for the kind introduction. And thank you so much, Bansi, sir, for uh, having me here to talk on this topic, which uh, is, in, is uh, I am getting interested in a lot uh, in the coming, uh, in the recent times. And this is what I thought I should share with all of you uh, as to what is happening uh, with uh, the, the approach towards management of chronic diseases uh, like diabetes. So we have, uh, I'm sure we have been talking about diabetes as well as the chronic illnesses that come along with diabetes, that is coronary artery disease, which finally affect the quality as well as uh, the longevity. And uh, apart from uh, monitoring and treating hyperlysemia, we are uh, in process of understanding these disorders more. We know that there is a very strong genetic uh, background to diabetes. We know there are monogenic diabetes like Dr. Ashish mentioned just before this talk. So these are purely genetic transmissions. But apart from that, what we're talking about is type 2 diabetes. And we know that the genetic uh, background of type 2 diabetes is very complicated. We cannot pinpoint to one particular gene. So we cannot pinpoint our treatment to a particular uh, pathway or a genetic uh, modification as a treatment for type 2 diabetes. Again, the disease is at such an endemic proportion uh, that we will not be able to manage it by, by uh, looking at the gene or modification of the gene. So our main treatment comes to treatment of hyperlysine. And again, I think if you have listened to the previous two lectures, we are seeing that more than 50% of our patients with diabetes do not reach to their target level. So there is something grossly missing in the way that we are managing this disease. And I think we need to look into uh, detail aspects of the pathophysiology and causation of the disease apart from just treating the hyperlysemia. So I would like to share my thoughts on how our thinking about genetics in health and disease is changing and how the factors that were considered non-modifiable uh, earlier are coming into the modifiable factors list, list and unless we uh, try to learn them, I think we'll get back uh, behind in the way the future is changing in treatment of these disorders. So I would like to uh, talk about how understanding uh, uh, about genetics is changing, how we are understanding these transmissions in a newer way, what are the windows of opportunity to peep in and intervene so that we change the course of the disease in one as well as more than one generations and more than one individuals. And then how does it matter in our clinical practice? Is it just a theoretical topic or topic for research? And when it comes to the clinical uh, treatment, sitting in front of a patient in the clinic, does all this information matter to us or not? So coming to the first point, understanding genetics in a better way. There was a society called Fetal Origin of Health and Disorders. Uh, we know it as a very famous Barker's hypothesis. Uh, Dr. Yagnik sir from Pune has contributed a lot to this topic where they thought that the exposure of the fetus in the mother's womb of various environmental factors will decide how the individual's health and propensity to disease in future long-term health uh, will be affected. Now, it was changed to developmental origin of health and disorders. So it is not only those nine months in the mother's womb, but also certain important stages throughout the patient's or individual's life that can get modified by environmental exposures. And we are here not only uh, trying to see the influence on an individual and not for a shorter period of time. Throughout the life, the developmental origins of health and disorders can be affected, can be modified favorably as well as non-favorably. And it is not only the individual, but a generation to come can change because of such exposures. So earlier this was thought to be non-modifiable, but now many of the factors are coming in the list of modifiable factors. Now, looking at the role of genes in chronic health and disorders, if you're talking about a disease which is such um, uh, at an endemic proportion, I think we need to talk it uh, at the basic level. So the gene, as we know, as a, uh, as a DNA strand, the similarity of genes between a man and a chimpanzee is 98%. And one human to another human is 99.9%. So there is definitely very little to understand by uh, studying the genes. Because 
uh, we know that we are nothing like chimpanzee and one human being doesn't behave in terms of health and diseases for that matter even type 2 diabetes one individual is nothing like the other individual when it comes to the disease and health so if it is not genes then what is it that is giving an influence through the genetic transfer so the uh, the genetic transfer has three components one is genome that we have seen the pool of genes dna sequences second is an epigenome which are the proteins that cover the gene uh, uh, genetic strands which are modifiable which decide how a genetic profile will get expressed and these are modifiable and what mo can modify epigenomic expressions are called exposomes now these exposomes can have anything which is specific to an individual specific to an external environment specific to an internal environment or a general external environment it can be medicine it can be pollution it can be nuclear radiation it can be anything that can affect a uh, affect an epigenomic profile and change how a gene will be expressed in a given human being so unlike genetic changes epigenetic changes are reversible and do not change your dna sequence but they can change how your body reads a dna sequence in other words if you are provided with a face which can be uh, simulated with a genetic profile the expression of the face can be uh, compared to the epigenetic influences so with the same face you can have different uh, expressions and similarly with the same genetic makeup uh, a human being can have different uh, ex uh, expressions depending on the modification that happens at the epigenetic level and this is a very interesting article if any one of you is interested in topic by dr sanjay kalra sir of metabolic karma how uh, it can change our destiny and when we don't understand this link we call it destiny or when we don't understand the link we call it as non modifiable even though now that we are understanding it better we are trying to pull it from a non modifiable factor towards the modifiable factor so like i said uh, there would be multiple windows of opportunity to peep in and intervene to modify or influence the epigenetic ex uh, expressions so we know the life cycle which starts from in utero infancy early childhood puberty youth reproductive years which includes pregnancy in women and then here we have andro or menopause and aging and believe me each of this stage uh, is Uh, and window of opportunity to modify how epigenetic uh, changes will decide the genetic expression either favorably or non favorably and un unless we understand this we will be not in position to modify the unfavorable factors towards the favorable factors so we need to keep looking for the windows for opportunity for intervention and changing the path the way the genes get expressed in future so coming at what can modify this what exactly we need to do that can modify epigenome so it's a vast list of things that can modify epigenome and these are called exposomes and thankful to yagnik sir for introducing me to this term it can be a specific external environment like drug chemical pollution general external environment like climate change in the environment change in the season it can be internal environment the patient's genetic profile transcriptomics proteomics and metabolomics and then health risk and impact uh, health risk and impact assessment can also be a uh, part of modifiable exposomes so for example which we can relate to our day to day practice hyperglycemia during pregnancy if we modify the level of glycemia during pregnancy we know that we are modifying the health and disease risk of the child that is born maternal nutrition as we know has a very strong impact on the uh, baby's birth weight and the birth weight has a very strong impact on the future health of the child anti aging living long is another way of uh, looking at uh, is another subject or matter subject matter where people are looking at changing epigenomic expressions and improving the longevity as well as the quality of life and then coming to the clinic level pharmacoepigenetics of type 2 diabetes now as i uh, described uh, we would see what are the evidences we know that hyperglycemia model is a very known model uh, the children who are exposed to hyperglycemia during mother's womb have a very high risk of developing diabetes in future 
So this is something that can modify the epigenomic expressions. Birth weight, we know, is a very strong predictor of the health and disease of the child born. Uh, as the birth weight changes from uh, towards higher or lower of normalcy, the chances of developing uh, chronic heart diseases in these patients are changing. Another example is prior to pregnancy. Why wait till pregnancy? The effect of maternal, surgical or medical weight loss in mothers uh, has an improved outcome outcome of the intergenerational transmission of obesity, a favorable outcome, significant maternal weight loss modifies the obesity related uh, uh, risk in children. Why only mother? Even the paternal exercise improves gluco glucose metabolism in the adulthood. Lactation has been shown to reduce the risk of developing uh, diseases in the child as well as uh, the future uh, mother's life. So there are these are multiple windows of opportunity where we can actually change the future risk of the disease as well as decide how healthy the individual is going to be. So there is an intergenerational programming. There is It's never too late or never too early to start changing the epigenomic expressions. It will take much longer to normalize the fetal growth or capacity, but we start early and we keep continuing the improvement. There are strong and sustained improvements in the health and disease parameters. Now, epigenetic influences, uh, they have a potential to influence a large number of uh, uh, people together in family as a herd or as a society. And they can influence more than one subject at a time. Eating habits of a family are likely to have an effect on a larger uh, number of people rather than just treating one person. Now we have windows of opportunity at every level of development in men and women. At adolescents, their puberty has to be normal. Then in youth, if we control obesity, in pregnancy, if we control hyperlysemia, we change the fetal programming by changing the hyperlysemia status of the mother. And during menopause, if we treat these chronic disorders, we are reducing the chronic complications that arise. So it's a continuous process. Never say it's too late to modify your genes and epigenetics. What does it mean to, to us in the clinical practice when I'm sitting in front of the patient? So now there are studies happening at the clinical level where epigenetic modifications are looked at as another way of modifying the disease outcome. Uh, especially, we are talk, going to talk about type 2 diabetes. So Dr. Ling um, uh, has good amount of data. And if you want to go back, you can Go to her lectures, they're there on the YouTube as well as uh, a lot of publications uh, in the international journals. So epigenetic modification in type 2 diabetes, they are looking at three to four main aspects, DNA methylation, histone modification, and non-coding mRNA. I know at clinical level, these things may not mean anything, but there is a genome-wide epigenetic analysis in human, which is now used to predict to prevent and to treat type 2 diabetes. How we are going to look at? These are some parameters that can be used as epigenetic markers and their modification in patients with type 2 diabetes. So for an example, we'll go ahead with just one study done on newly diagnosed drug knife type 2 diabetes patients. They were treated with metformin and two studies were done. One to see if there are any epigenetic markers that can tell us a glycemic response of a person to metformin therapy, and second, the tolerance to metformin therapy. So uh, the, the study compared people who responded to metformin versus who did not respond to metformin, and secondly, those who were tolerant and intolerant to metformin. And they found that they could very strongly identify through epigenetic parameters patients who will respond to metformin and patients who will have intolerance to metformin. By this, we are saving a lot of people who will be non-responders to metformin and intolerant to metformin by giving them metformin and causing complications. Now, coming to the pharmaco, slightly detailed aspect of pharmacoepigenetics in type 2 diabetes, what all an epigenetic uh, study can do in a clinic. So one is blood-based markers, like we have seen, there are a list of blood uh, epigenetic markers that can predict a response or a tolerance to the therapy. For example, we had metformin, it could be SGLT2 inhibitors, it could be GLP-1 analogs. GLP-1 analogs are so costly. If initially I know if the patient will respond to it or not, if the patient will have side effects or not, 
it will become very easy for me to choose the right patient for giving glp1 therapy then individual dis- differences in response to therapy due to epigenetic mechanism this is something like culture and sensitivity that we do that this is the person who will respond to this particular therapy therapy induced epigenetic alteration am i giving the drug and changing only the level of hyperglycemia or the drug is also changing some epigenetic factors that can either favorably or unfavorably uh, influence the outcome of a disease and then finally we might dream of epigenetic therapies including epigenetic inhibitors of uh, epigenetic enzymes which can be curable or uh, reverse make reversible changes in the pathophysiology of the disease so we must know this because the future isn't very far we can predict response and have new therapeutic targets if anyone is interested there are further readings where we can have fetal programming theories how stress and mismatch can cause problems there is a very interesting but relatively well, less well understood theory that is psychologically focused fetal programming so there are epigenetic changes that can be modified or influenced by changing the psychological profile Uh, of the mother or for that matter of the father so with that we come to the summary of the talk we have seen that genetics understanding has changed we understand genes and its modification through epigenetic factors there are multiple windows to peep in identify modifiable exposomes at many levels and you can not only change the individual's life but of the generations to come and it will not be very far when we use epigenetic and genetic markers in our clinic to predict response and the right therapy for the right patient with that i would like to thank uh, the organizers and chairpersons and if there are any questions i'll be happy to take